So uh, next we have uh, Professor Liao from UCLA, uh, who's going to talk to us about biofuel, uh, uh, producing biofuels. I just changed my slide uh, in the last 10 minutes. I have to say that uh, I'm very proud of my battery. It still works. <laughs> I forgot to bring my power supply to, from the building next door. It lasts for 30 minutes uh, up to now. So we all know that uh, we have a problem of energy. <clears throat> and these are probably the resources that we can deal with. We have sunlight. We have carbon dioxide. We have water, sort of. And we have nitrogen, a lot of them. And currently what we are doing is we take sunlight and convert it to electricity, as we all heard from solar panel or from uh, uh, wind power. Or alternatively, we use biological ways to use sunlight to absorb CO2, and we produce liquid form of fuel that we can use. The problem of sunlight is just like the problem of electricity. That is, we cannot store it. We cannot store sunlight, no matter how we like uh, uh, California. Uh, sometimes we still get uh, cloudy days like today. Electricity, although we made a lot of uh, progress, as we heard, is still not uh, a long-term storage uh, method. So let's examine what are our alternatives, and let's try to think out of the box. So currently what we are doing is uh, what I mean, what we mean, the, the society, in general, trying to take CO2, uh, take a sunlight, use that to power photosynthesis. And we use uh, uh, sunlight to derive energy in a form that the cells can use, and use that to power CO2 assimilation. And that's why we have plants, that's why we have food to eat, and so on and so forth. And then we find a way to process the biomass and use that to make a liquid form of fuel, most uh, commonly is uh, ethanol. So we have a lot of steps to go through, and that probably uh, caused the inefficiency in between. So the first thing we try to do, not the first thing, but uh, one of the, the early things that uh, uh, we try to do is that we cut down all the middlemen, cut down all the intermediates. Instead of using plants, where we plant the plants and take the uh, uh, CO2 from atmosphere to build uh, cellulose. There's only one carbon in CO2. In cellulose, there are millions of carbons. And we take one carbon to millions of carbons and then degrade down to six carbons, sugar, and then eventually ferment that to two carbon, ethanol. So in order to, in order to get two carbons, we actually go through a big cycle of one to a million to six to two. Why don't we cut a middleman? We directly take CO2, go through carbon cycle, and produce the fuel we want without biomass. So we use a single cell organisms that can conduct uh, uh, photosynthesis. We know how to do genetic engineering. We know how to manipulate metabolism so we can connect all these dots. So what we accomplished is providing a way to channel the intermediates in Kelvin cycle. This intermediate is called pyruvate. And then we take that to a, a, a several different kinds of liquid uh, fuel. Instead of making ethanol, we make uh, isobutanol normal butanol, three metal, one butanol, two metal, one butanol. These are all longer chain alcohols that are more compatible with current day the vehicle. So we don't have to rely on the, uh, uh, the additional infrastructure change that uh, ethanol fuel uh, requires. So with that, we accomplished the production of uh, isobutanol and all other the, um, form of liquid, uh, liquid fuel directly from sunlight and CO2. So you can see there is a simple culture, uh, cyanobacteria will sun, shine, uh, shine sunlight to it and give CO2, it can evolve isobutanol or the, it's uh, or equivalent kind of, uh, of, of fuel. So that's the first alternative to what we are currently doing. Okay, this is all great. And we can now produce uh, various forms of uh, fuel and that essentially bypass the, one of the most difficult challenges that we have in um, biofuel production, that is degradation of uh, lignin cellulose. So 
all these forms utilize sunlight. We achieved a way to store sunlight into liquid fuel in this way. Okay, so we can now use sunlight and store the energy in liquid form. And this energy can be stored uh, just about forever because this is a very stable form of energy. You can use that whenever you like. The problem is that we cannot control when the sun shines. Okay? And current uh, schematics is that we use sunlight to drive the photosystems uh, photo in the uh, cyanobacteria that produce a usable form of energy called NADPH and ATP that drives the Kelvin cycle. If you remember your high school biology, Kelvin cycle is the cycle that fixes CO2 and it's so-called the dark reaction. And this part is, the core, is what, what we call the light reaction. And together we make biofuel. The problem is that in this scheme, the light reaction is a two-dimensional problem. It requires a lot of surface. And if we use biological systems, not only it requires a light exposure surface, but also you require lots of water. So now you combine the two-dimensional problem with the three-dimensional problem. Here you don't need the, the uh, dark reaction, you don't need surface area. Light reaction, you need surface area. That's why the problem becomes difficult. Now, if we can separate the two-dimensional problem from the three-dimensional uh, three problem, we may be able to do better. So if we can use light reaction to provide NADH and ATP and then transport this to somewhere where we have a big tank of solutions that can power this Kelvin cycle, then we may be doing better. So how do we achieve that? Instead of using biological systems, now we go back to solar cells that we are so proud of and we know it works. Okay, we heard from uh, Boeing that it works. We can easily convert the sunlight to electricity. The remaining challenge is can we convert electricity to a form of reducing power that can drive the NADPH reduction? If we can achieve that, then we can use that to power Kelvin cycle and achieve what we can achieve in the living cell. And if we can do that, theoretical calculation tells us that we can at least achieve twice as much efficiency as this biological system. And notice that the theoretical efficiency of this biological system is, although it's 5.7%, in practice we can only get about 0.3%. That's what currently what everybody's getting. If we use this system, we can increase, we can double the theoretical efficiency, and also the practical efficiency is much better, as I will explain a little bit later. So how do we do that? The first thing that uh, uh, most people will think is that this, let's use this electricity to split water. And then this water generate uh, hydrogen, and then let's use hydrogen to reduce NAD to NADH, uh, NADP to become NADPH. And that is okay, theoretically, and that's also okay in the laboratory, but it's not sustainable, it's not easy to scale up because hydrogen has a very low solubility in water. So if you put hydrogen in water, most of it just immediately come out to the solution. So it's not easily uh, uh, available to the cell. So instead of using hydrogen, we develop a way to use formic acid. Now formic acid can also be made using electrolysis by putting electricity in presence of water and CO2. Of course, you need to develop a better uh, catalyst. So far, this is just a demonstration of uh, principle. Then we can make formic acid in electricity. This is the old problem. Most people are trying to use this method to make methane or methanol. And all they got was formic acid. And because people didn't know how to deal with formic acid, so people gave up. We can take formic acid, use that to reduce NADP to make NADPH. And that's the form of energy that cells can use. Now our challenge is can we engineer an organism that can take formic acid to make fuel? And that is what we are, uh, uh, our accomplishment uh, using this genetic engineering scheme. We take an organism called Rastonia eutropha. This is a photosynthetic, I'm sorry, this is a non photosynthetic organism, but it has the ability to fix CO2. Typically, it takes uh, the reducing power from hydrogen. It also takes the reducing power from formic acid, but it doesn't make fuel. So, what we are doing is we genetically engineer this organism so that 
again, we can divert the intermediate to isopurinol or 3 methylpurinol. Now we accomplish from formic acid, we can take that to isopurinol and 3 methylpurinol. So then we can integrate the process. You put a cathode and NO in and put a CO2 that provides formic acid go into the cell, uh, decompose that back to CO2 that allowed this uh, Kelvin cycle to run. And then it, it, the uh, reducing the uh, power uh, is used to drive the uh, NADH formation. This is the form of a reducing equivalent that the cell can use. Together, it fix the CO2 and then turn the Kelvin cycle to isoburinol and burinol. So we can do that in, uh, in a separate uh, uh, stage by making uh, formic acid in one tank and then make, uh, produce formic acid, uh, uh, produce fuel in another. That's great, but that's also not very practical because if you have to separate formic acid from your electrolysis uh, tank, the cost is so high. Okay? That cannot be feasible. So the only way you, have to do, you can do it is combine the two processes in the same tank. So we made the next jump trying to integrate the two processes together, taking this uh, cathode and anode in the fermentation tank. We run the electricity. Unfortunately, as soon as we start the electricity, the cells stop growing, as if the cells is electrocuted, although it's not. Okay? What happened is that when electricity uh, runs, and especially in the, the, the fermentation medium, it produces a lot of uh, uh, free radicals, uh, uh, the superoxide, the nitric oxide, and so on and so forth. So we detect those compounds, and we come up with a very simple method. All we had to do is isolate the, the, uh, the anode okay, so that the cell doesn't touch those anodes immediately. So those toxic compounds actually have a very short half-life. As soon as long as you don't let the cells touch those uh, uh, compounds immediately, then the cells will be fine. So by combining all these processes, we come up with a uh, device. Now we can directly take electricity, and this electricity can come from um, either your, your grid or uh, the outlet or a solar panel. You introduce electricity into your fermenter, Put in CO2, it comes out isoburinol and, uh, and uh, 3 metal one burinol So this is another way that uh, one can use to store electric energy in a form that you can use directly today in the um, in transportation uh, sector. So you can almost think of this as a way to drive electric cars to use electricity without electric cars. Okay, you can use the regular cars and still use electricity as a power source. So what about the efficiency? Okay, so this is the way this efficiency can be calculated. The solar uh, 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 energy to electricity, now I use a lower bound, at least one can get 8%. And I use a very conservative uh, upper bound, 25%. We heard that uh, in multiple junctions, we can get to 40 50% already. Okay. So let's say in a conservative way, most likely we can get easily get the 15%. The efficiency of electrolysis, I give a range from literature, is about 50 to 80%. Of course, this is pre-optimized uh, uh, range, and most likely we can easily get about 60%. The theoretical efficiency from taking electricity to isoburinol is 50%. Okay, and if we can achieve 60% of, of, of the theoretical value, we're doing pretty well. So altogether, it's very likely that within a few uh, rounds of uh, optimization, we can get to 3% overall energy efficiency. And that is 10%, uh, uh, sorry, 10 times higher than any biofuel made today. <clears throat> and now if you compare the energy density with the other forms of energy uh, storage uh, approaches, Lithium-ion battery, we know that uh, it's improving, but the energy density is still relatively uh, low. This, I, I recall this is probably at least two, three years uh, uh, old data. Liquid fuel, that the kind of liquid fuel we produce is 44 uh, megajoule per kilogram. is at least uh, 10 times uh, to 100 times higher than the, any other forms. 
uh, compared to the practical way currently people are working on is pumping water uphill, which is uh, very effective, but its uh, energy density is extremely low. So what we accomplish now is instead of uh, two divergent forms of energy solutions, now we were able to connect these two forms of energy solutions. We're able to take sunlight either directly through uh, the biological system or to the electrical uh, side and use that to power CO2 fixation. Okay, so now we can um, address the, uh, the CO2 uh, accumulation problem as well as the energy um, storage and energy uh, generation problem at the same time. Thank you very much. Time is up. Thank you.